Civil Procedure, Jurisdiction. This is the lecture on consent. Okay, our next case is Hess versus Pulowski. And uh, the first question that we would ask is, what was the nature of this dispute? Now, let me give you a tip about preparing for your classes for law school. Very often, you will feel that you're in an adversarial situation with your law professor, that it's uh, you against the professors. That may be one view of it. There's a, a, a better view, perhaps a better view of it. When you are studying the law, when you are reading the cases, you're going through all this material, and you're, you're absorbing it, you're, you're learning it, you're taking notes in class, you're writing your outline uh, while you're uh, doing your, your, your briefing, your briefing uh, at home while you're doing your, your homework. And um, one of the things you can try to do is anticipate what the professor is going to ask you. And that's part of what we're, we're trying to do here, to, to give you a sense of, of not only going through the materials and getting through the materials, but to get a sense of, of anticipate, antis, anticipate, <laughs> anticipation, a sense of anticipation, of figuring out what the professor is likely to ask the next day when you, you're going through these cases. So here we have uh, a situation, Hess versus Pulaski, and, and, and the question is, what is the nature of the dispute? That's obviously, not obviously, but very often, that's the, the kind of question that a professor is going to ask. And, and here's what, the, what was said in that case. This action was brought by defendant in error to recover damages for personal injuries. Now, here's a term of art, defendant in error. Plaintiff in error is a situation in which plaintiff in error is the appellant. In other words, this is a person who was saying that the lower court ruled erroneously. That's the error that they're talking about. They're saying that the plaintiff made an error. The appellant, who may have been the plaintiff in the lower court, or he may have been the defendant in the lower court. The person who is appealing is now the appellant and the, 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 the uh, plaintiff in error. So the defendant in error is the person who is defending against the, this appeal. Uh, this is the appellee. This action was brought by defendant in error to recover damages for personal injury. So what they're telling you is that uh, the plaintiff won in the lower court and the defendant in the lower court is now appealing. So the plaintiff from the lower court is now the defendant in error. The declaration, the, the declaration alleged that the plaintiff in error negligently and wantonly drove a motor vehicle on a public highway in Massachusetts and that by reason thereof, the vehicle struck an injured defendant in error. Plaintiff in error is a resident of Pennsylvania. No personal service was made on him and no property belonging to him was attached. The service of process was made in compliance with Chapter 90, General Laws of Massachusetts, as amended by Statute 1923. Okay, so what they're telling you is that there was a, 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 a vehicular accident and uh, the plaintiff in that lawsuit, one in the lower court, and the uh, personal service upon the person who was the defendant in the lower court is the subject of this, of this uh, appeal. Here's a, another question that you should anticipate that a professor might ask you. What was the importance of the public interest in this particular case? Now, what you need to do when you're when you, as you're going through the courses, as you're going through the cases and, and reading these materials, it's very important that you pick out the language that is obviously or, or, or apparently uh, important to the case, important in some way to the facts, important to the court's rationale, important to the outcome of the case. And what was, here was what was said in, 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 the, uh, in this particular case regarding the, the public interest. Motor vehicles are dangerous machines, and even when skillfully and carefully operated, their use is attended by serious dangers to persons and property. In the public interest, the state may make and enforce regulations reasonably calculated to promote care on the part of all, residents and non-residents alike, who use its highways. The measure in question operates to require a non-resident 
to answer for his conduct in the state where arise causes of action alleged against him, as well as to provide for a claimant a convenient method by which he may sue to enforce his rights. So what the court is saying in that paragraph is you have a situation where someone from out of state drives into the state, is engaged in some sort of situation where there's an accident, and then leaves the state. The person who is injured in the state wants to be able to have some sort of recourse against the person uh, who injured him and left the state. So that is the, the, the essence of, of what this, this uh, interest in, the, what the public interest is in, in this particular case. Another question that you may anticipate, what was the nature of the consent that was implied by the law in this case? All right, this is, where, this is what we call implied consent. Now, as you're reading the materials, in a, you're, you're anticipating these questions, you're reading these materials, and you come across this passage. Under the statute, the implied consent is limited to, to proceedings growing out of accidents or collisions on a highway in which the non-resident may be involved. It is required that he shall actually receive and, and receipt. He shall actually receive and receipt for or a, a typo. He shall actually receive, very often when you're reading a case, you'll find that the court has made a typographical error. Receive a receipt for notice of the service and a copy of the process. And it contemplates such continuances as may be found necessary to give reasonable time and opportunity for defense. It makes no hostile discrimination against non-residents, but tends to put them on the same footing as residents. Literal and precise equality in respect of this matter is not attainable. It is not required. The state's power to regulate the use of its highways extends to their use by, by non-residents as well as by residents. That makes sense. In other words, people come in from out of state. They use the highway within the state. They should be held accountable to the state for their behavior when they're using the highway. And in advance of the operation of a motor vehicle on its highway by a non-resident, the state may require him to appoint one of its officials as his agent upon whom process may be served in proceedings growing out of such use. So what the court is saying is this. The state may designate, designate the Secretary of State or some other person who will be deemed to be the agent of a non-resident so that if a non-resident comes into the state, gets involved with an in, in an accident, and uh, injures someone who is a resident of the state, the Secretary of State or some other designee of the state may be considered the agent of the person who is out of state and was involved with the accident. That way, what this means when, they're talk when we're talking in, in this situation by service of process, we're talking about the commencement of the lawsuit, filing of the, uh, of the notice, summons, and, and complaint to notify the uh, defendant that you know, they, they have now have noticed that they're being sued. So since this person is out of state, the plaintiff in this situation can serve process upon the Secretary of State. 